Hi, everyone. I know it's after lunch, so take a moment, just do a quick stretch, I don't know, move, clap. Uh, anyway, I'm going to be talking about mapping access to green space in the City of Toronto. And this actually aligns very well with the previous two presentations. I'm glad they didn't disagree with anything I'm about to say. <laughs> um, but I'll just dive in and say I want to make three important points. And I'll start with why I'm doing this. Um, my background is in population health research, particularly an evidence-based approach to improving the social determinants of health and removing barriers to uh, accessing health services. So access to parks um, fits in that. How I'm going to do this, I'm going to first review a little bit of the background on existing approaches to mapping access, kind of agrees with some things that have been shown. And then I'll introduce a new approach to mapping access that uses a network uh, calculated in Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, and that will show you how you can change the way you measure access using the road network as opposed to a circular buffer. So in the context of public health, uh, some of you may know that Toronto Public Health recently reduced, uh, produced this evidence review, and I won't go into details, but simply to say there is a breadth of evidence suggesting that access to parks and green space um, has a direct impact on physical health, both directly through increased activity or indirectly through reduced uh, obesity and reduced chronic disease, as well as really important social health and mental health aspects. Um, so that's the context. We want to get people to parks. Now I say parks, but we all know that we access a myriad of different types of green space um, in particular. So to give you a little context in the city of Toronto, uh, this is a little fuzzy, but you can see the lighter green areas are the open space zoning, which does occupy a large portion of the city. And then the darker green areas are the actual parkland, uh, which cover about 13% of the land area in the city. So these are the two primary data sets that I'm going to investigate, both from open data and I should put the caveat in, you may notice certain parts are missing. That's just a fact of the data. So moving forward, I hope we can update that. And as an alternative perspective, it is important to recognize that something like land cover, this is also open data on the uh, tree cover and natural area surfaces. We could integrate this into our modeling process, but that's another question for a longer term project. And then the other side of access, of course, is where the people live. So this shows one dot for every single person, 2.3 million in the city. And you get a sense that there's a large portion of the, the density is, is in the downtown core, but um, there is a lot of open space and empty area. So we need to refine our analysis, not to show data for everywhere, but show it for where the people actually live. So in the context of the city, how do we currently map access. Um, Adam just showed us one example, uh, but at a broader view, we should look at Toronto in the context of some comparable municipalities. We are doing great. You should all pat yourself on the back. There's a lot of parkland. Um, the challenge is that over time, we're not adding enough to make up for the population increase. So we're actually reducing the amount of parkland per capita. And if we look at a more nuanced perspective, you can see that the, the LPAC, so the local parkland assessment cells, give us a, a nice indication of the total area of parkland per capita. And this is a useful measure. The, the drawback is it doesn't reflect the internal variability within each LPAC. And it doesn't reflect the changes across boundaries where if you live on the edge of one, you may not really, the, the data doesn't reflect the individual experience. So what I'm going to do is give you a different perspective that addresses those limitations. So a, a traditional buffer would show areas outside 500 meters, as the city did for some planning in 2013. Vancouver uses a similar approach, it's, uh, 400 meters in this case, which is the five minute walking range. So what I did was actually update Toronto's data. This is the most basic, just 400 meter circular buffer. And if you use that approach and refine it to just show the people, so these are those same dots, 95.2% of the city is within that circular 400 meter buffer. And that's great. You're actually better than Vancouver. Um, but what I want to do is show you a different approach, a network-based approach. So if you take, instead of that circular buffer, 
if you look at the sort of coverage area or the catchment area of the park in terms of a walk shed, uh, you can start to see a different uh, catchment area. So if you do that same analysis, this is the same map, but then you refine it to be a network-based approach, you can see the drop to 87.4%. So this is a more realistic uh, performance measure for the city, and I think moving forward, this is the approach that I think the city should use. And it also enables improvements through not just new parkland, but through new access. So if you add a connection, you can actually improve your performance. But this isn't the end goal. What I wanted to do was actually create a continuous measure to model the access to parkland at an individual block scale level. So instead of just mapping a sort of buffer around parks, what I did was create a grid spaced every 100 meters across the entire city. So that's about a million points spaced out across the city. And for every single point, I mapped a walk shed. So you take that area, you calculate the fraction which is park space, and then you divide that by the fraction, or sorry, the total population represented here as these little dots. So don't get lost in the details. It doesn't really matter. This is very sophisticated modeling. But at the end of the day, this is what you get. Um, basically, yellow areas show where there's no parks within a five-minute walk. And then there's a gradient. Instead of just that binary access or no access, you start to see how much land is within that walk shed area. So if you live in this little dot, you have no access. If you live in this light shade, you have 1% to 5% of your land area is park or open space, as I've added in the open space layer. Now, take a deep breath. This is pretty cool. I, I was really excited with this. Um, but the next step was then to integrate the population and standardize the result as a measure of parkland per capita, just like those LPAC cells. But in this case, we're doing it for a million points across the city to come up with um, basically a measure of total parkland area per capita. So you see some hot spots in the downtown core where we have a lot of people and not a lot of parkland. It's not too surprising. And I should put the caveat in that some areas are industrial land where we don't need a lot of parkland. And the other uh, aspect that's not reflected is the daytime population. So commercial areas may be underserved here uh, if they're just office workers. And we could integrate those through other data sets, but this was a relatively small project. <laughs> so in comparison to the current approach, uh, I'm just going to give you a bit of a summary at the end, but it does give you more detailed data, more nuanced, um, and a little more exciting for the public to engage with. And in the, term, in the spirit of public engagement, I've actually created a, an interactive map. It's a very detailed, zoomable web map. So you can go online to this address, which will be shared with you. Zoom into your neighborhood, look at your house, see how it compares to your friends across the city, and get a sense of how your access compares. And then start to have a conversation. So if we extend this West Toronto rail path, that might improve access to this population, which is currently underserved, and increase the connections across that railway. So those are the types of opportunities and the conversations I hope to inspire. So finally, just to summarize, grid cells really are uh, the way of the future. It's a more nuanced local data set, which gives you block-by-block -block results. And you can also aggregate the data. So you could create an average for every ward, for example, and come up with some rankings. Uh, the network-based approach provides a more nuanced reality uh, versus the circular buffer, which doesn't reflect true access. Green space per person provides a sort of equity measure, and you can choose to integrate that or not. And then finally, performance can be improved not only through new parks, which we know are very difficult to create, but through new access. So Section 37 funds can be used to fund access to ravines and other green space. And I hope that we start to have those conversations about improving access. So finally, just to sort of explain the context, this is the Lower Don Valley. Uh, we're having this grand conversation with the Evergreen Foundation about the Lower Don Valley and talking about new connections. This is a new bridge they're proposing. And there's an existing railway trestle which could connect the lower income tower neighborhoods over to the, the brickworks. So these are the types of conversations I hope to inspire.
So thank you for your time.